Hello everyone, I'm going to be doing a book review of The Path to Paradise, a Francis Ford Coppola story by Sam Wasson. Um, this book came out last year, I think last November, December, so it's still a fairly recent book. Um, a few things I'll say at the top, it's not a conventional biography of, of a filmmaker, it's not, by that I mean it's not a linear biography. Um, Wasan gives this book a very a cinematic structure where it's really focused on two particular periods in Coppola's life, the making of Apocalypse Now in the late 1970s, and then uh, One from the Heart, which was his follow-up to um, follow-up film to Apocalypse Now. So I will say, though, I think the structure of the book really helped it out. It really brought a... I think an energy to the book and like its subject, there's just a lot of energy to the prose in this book. And there's been a lot written on Coppola um, since the 1970s, since he broke onto the scene. But this book, I think it does provide some insight in, into Coppola and what has driven him throughout his filmmaking career and and the highs and lows. Um, why there's been a lot of highs, a lot of lows in his career. Um, a little bit of background on Coppola. He grew up in a um, large Italian-American family. Um, his father, Carmine, was a, a musician, a composer in his own right. Um, he had an older brother, um, who was also very gifted and was sort of a lot of the focus on the family was on the older brother of August who um, Francis looked up to, but Francis was the second son and, you know, his early childhood, you know, he kind of had um, a sense of being neglected. Um, he contracted polio as a child and, would have to spend a year in bed where he was really um, like his entire left side was paranoid or not paranoid. It was paralyzed at one point. So, you know, so that fed into Coppola's active imagination, you know, that time when he was unwell, it really, it really brought his um, imagination into full focus watching TV. I mean, this is in, in the 1950s. And, you know, later on, he got well, he became healthy, and he eventually went to college and focused on theater at, at Hofstra College in, in Long Island. And he was a real operator in college, you know, um, quickly taking creative control over the theater program and directing plays, and even writing his own plays. And he, from there, you know, he got got into um, UCLA Film School and, and started um, working, making films as a student, and which was a relatively new thing. I mean, this is in the late 50s, early 60s. And he was just a, such a wheeler dealer. He was always um, meeting people, and he was just a whirlwind of energy, of ideas. You know, he's writing plays and writing screenplays and you know, he's any artistic pursuit. Um, Coppola was was just um, just a whirlwind of energy. Um, he married quite young, married his wife Eleanor Coppola, and 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 she plays a prominent role in the book as well. And the book gets into the the roller coaster marriage between um, Francis and Eleanor. So Coppola made a film for Roger Corman, who was known for making low-budget movies in, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, so that kind of made Coppola, got his name out there as, as, a, um, as a filmmaker. And eventually he got into the Hollywood system and started making movies for Hollywood. Um, he made a movie called The Year of Big Boy Now, which was his first Hollywood film. He's also writing screenplays a lot. You know, really, it seems like first and foremost, foremost Coppola is really a writer. And he's he's cranking out screenplays. And he's selling screenplays, and he eventually um, got a chance to direct um, a big Hollywood musical, Finian's Rainbow, 
which the film didn't do well. And Coppola didn't really have a great time directing um, this kind of very old school musical. But he did that did bring him into contact with George Lucas, who was an intern for the studio on that film. And the two of them, yeah, and George Lucas is another major character in this book as... I wouldn't say Lucas became Cop Coppola's protege, but they became, you know, like their relationship would have its its highs and lows. You know, Lucas had, was a well known as a student filmmaker at USC. So, and you could say maybe Lucas was like the more pure film filmmaker than Coppola was, like because Coppola always had his hands in in so many different um, different art forms. But anyway, along with Lucas, by the late 60s, Coppola is just full of ideas and he wants to start his own studio based in San Francisco. And this is what became American Zotro, which was a place where Coppola wanted to attract creative people of all sorts, you know, filmmakers, writers, um, painters and really create this alternative studio to Hollywood where they could make their own films. And, you know, this is the height of the counterculture. And it was really an exciting thing. And this is what Lucas was very much involved in this. And, and Coppola was getting very experimental by this point. You know, he would quit after the, the studio experience of making Finian's Rainbow, he went on the road and made a movie called The Rain People, which is not a well-known movie. Coppola fanatics know the movie, but with The Rain People was filmed on the road. They traveled all over the country. The film is about a woman who leaves her husband, and she kind of goes on her own journey um, through America. And it's, it's very much a, a late 60s type of movie. And uh, Lucas also... I guess worked as Coppola's assistant. Lucas would make a famous um, documentary on the making of the Rain People. So, so that was a real um, burst of creative energy that that Coppola had, and brought it to um, his own company, um, American Zotro. And the story—I don't want to get too much in the weeds of um, what happened with Zotro because a lot of financial stuff, and sometimes when the book gets into a lot of the financial dealings of Coppola, which are really kind of, kind of um, manic at times. What I learned about Coppola is he doesn't really money's never an obstacle for him. Like he doesn't really worry about money. You know, as far as Coppola looks at it, is we'll find a way to do this. The money problems, the financial stuff will work itself out. And so he was very um, liberal with his use of money. It wasn't something he worried about a lot. Whereas that would separate him from George Lucas, who was always throughout his career concerned with money and finances and making sure that he had all of his funding in order to, to fund his projects. And of course, Lucas would go on to make the Star Wars movies, which allowed him to become a completely independent um, filmmaker where he didn't have to depend on studios to, to bank his movies. And Coppola, on the other hand, wanted that too, but Coppola was so erratic, though, he would just take these big swings and would, you know, would um, just have these gargantuan projects in his mind all the time. And so in the early, what happened with Zotro, basically, it did run into financial issues and Coppola had to um, go make move become a director for hire to, to basically keep the, his company afloat. So this is what led him to getting involved in The Godfather, the first Godfather movie, a project Coppola initially wasn't too enthused about doing. He didn't like the novel that much, but um, in time he did become enthused with the project and he felt that he could take this really kind of pulpy, trashy novel and really turn it into... Um, um, a, a real piece of commercial art, which he did, you know, in the story. And this, then the focus of the book is not on the making of The Godfather. I mean, that's been covered many other places, but it was a big hit. 
It allowed Coppola to make The Godfather Part Two, which he had far more creative control over the making of that film, and it was a smash success. In between those two Godfather films, he made uh, um, the conversation with uh, Gene Hackman, a, a very, um, a very um, famous movie, a more artful movie about surveillance and technology and the human condition and all these things. You know, a very personal film that Coppola made in, in between the two Godfather movies. But the two Godfather films were also very personal movies in their own way. You know, Coppola would often talk about oh, he was like Michael, you know, Michael's, you know, rise and fall in, in Godfather. And Coppola is always kind of comparing himself to his fictional characters, which would play into um, Apocalypse Now, which Coppola would spend basically the latter portion of the 70s making. And, and that's really the focus of this book. You know, initially Apocalypse Now was going to be a George Lucas movie, and the, the script was written by John Milius, who was a close association of of um, of them. And and through you know through events, um, Lucas got involved with making the Star Wars films, and basically um, Coppola stepped in to make Apocalypse Now, which he had gained a lot of interest in the project. Um, because it was about the Vietnam War, it was based on Heart of Darkness, a Joseph Conrad novel, and Lucas wanted to make it more as like a documentary, you know, a go to Vietnam and actually make a very on-the-ground documentary, and Coppola had a completely different idea of it. He had this, he wanted to make it this huge artistic statement, you know, about, not even really about the Vietnam War, you know, and the movie, the way the final the final movie ended up, it wasn't really necessarily about Vietnam. It simply used the Vietnam War to to make a lot of these big statements that Coppola wanted to make, and and you know the the film was shot in the Philippines. And, I mean, this would go on for years. Um, Coppola would spend a few years going back and forth between the Philippines and, and where his home base in San Francisco. And, um, and Coppola's whole idea, his immersive process, you know, he, everyone kind of went crazy making Apocalypse Now, and that comes out in the book. And Colonel Kurtz, you know, the, the in the movie, the colonel who loses his mind and kind of becomes a cult leader, and Coppola, he felt he had to kind of become Kurtz. And Coppola kind of becomes a um, megalomaniac during the making of Apocalypse Now. Like, that's been documented in the film his wife, Eleanor, made, um, Heart of Darkness. And and um, it was just an insane experience. You know, at one point, you know, there was a hurricane that that nearly destroyed the production. And his lead act, he had Harvey Keitel, was the original lead actor who... Coppola didn't get along with and brought in Martin Sheen and Sheen um, had a heart attack midway through production that almost ruined everything. So, so they're really spending years in the jungle making this movie. And I feel like Wasan didn't even tell, I feel like there, that was almost like a whole book in itself. And I'm sure he had enough material for a whole book just on the total insanity of making Apocalypse Now. The post-production was equally as as um, acrimonious as the, the the actual production of the film, and well, long story short, the film did come out finally in 1979 when you know they had started filming it in '76, and it did well. I mean, Coppola received high acclaim, and it was a huge deal when it came out. But it wasn't as big as Star Wars, you know, and and this is something you kind of get in the book as well. This rivalry between Coppola and Lucas and, and kind of um, Lucas, the conservative businessman at heart, kind of, you know, sailing along quite smoothly as Coppola is just getting into megalomania and, and, and all these things. And the 
mainly the second half of the book is about the making of One from the Heart, which was a Coppola, a musical he made that was going to be filmed, that was filmed at Zoetrope at his studios. And once again, this, this film just went way over budget. There was, um, you know, he was going through a, a lot of personal stuff, a lot of personal stuff during the making of this movie. Meanwhile, he has all these other plans in place. I mean, and you get a sense of just how, how full of ideas he is. I mean, he's not just thinking of movies all the time. Like he's thinking about starting schools and his business ventures with winemaking and his interest in technology and, always, you know, wanting to find the best technology to improve movie making and, and, you know, just um, really interesting and always writing, always writing, always having books he's looking for and just always, you know, kind of doing five, six things at the same time. Well, One for the Heart was a major flop commercially and critically and, and Coppola ended up going bankrupt, really had a financial disaster, and would really have to spend the 80s and the 90s as a director for hire, you know, making, basically making movies just to pay off his debts, because it was, it was, um, the situation was that dire for him financially, and the book, and this book ended now as Coppola over the past year has, is making a new movie uh, called Megalopolis, which is a project that's been in his mind since the, the 1980s for 40 years. And Megalopolis is about an architect who wants to build a futuristic city and has to deal with a lot of the more has to fight the status quo. That sounds like what the story is basically about. So you can easily see this being something that's really fascinating. Coppola. So, so I'm glad Megalopolis, you know, the, the, as far as I know, the shooting of the film, it's in post-production right now and could come out this year. So, so, and I think reading this book, if you're a real film fan and if you're really interested in Megalopolis and, what that movie might look like. This book will provide a, a lot of insight. You know, there's just a lot of great anecdotes in the book. You learn a lot about his family um, and um, his marriage and his um, amazing generosity. You get this in the book too, where he is incredibly generous to anyone who's, you know, wants to get into the arts. You know, he's, he, he has such an open door policy of, of trying to, to help people, sometimes to his detriment, sometimes generous to the point of um, being, um, maybe taking it, it too far. Um, but, you know, it's um, the idea today of like film directors going off into the jungle and kind of going crazy and becoming a megalomaniac. These days, that would sound really ridiculous, probably, to a lot of people. And, and you can wonder, you know, like George Lucas would never do that. George Lucas is always, first and foremost, a professional. And I think most filmmakers are. You know, you you, you have to keep a, a clear head. And Coppola pushed that. He was always pushing the boundaries of, you know, he, he didn't really feel himself as a filmmaker, necessarily. He was an artist, you know, and he's always trying to push boundaries of art. And so there's that side of cinema as well. You know, a side of cinema that certainly America, American cinema did not kind of go in that direction. You know, Lucas was sort of probably provided the model that a lot of more filmmakers have followed. And Coppola has been, you know, viewed as he's made brilliant movies and he's a true visionary, no doubt. But um, at great cost, you know, and he's willing, you know, that's one thing in the book too. He's willing to accept that, you know, if it all fails, it all fails, but that's what it's all about. You know, you're always gambling. You're always pushing the envelope forward. And that's interesting in the book. So, so like I said, I know the author had a lot of access to archives. So 
there's probably a lot in this book that's not been in the other books on this on the subject matter so it's very valuable in that regard and um yeah it's just um a really engaging book i mean probably this book is for mainly um movie fans particularly you know like people like the godfather they might might be drawn to this book but like i said it's interesting to think of who the readership for this book might be but but certainly if you're interested in american cinema of the late 20th century this is um a must read so thanks for watching and i will talk to you later